Hi, and welcome back to the shop, and welcome to the third part of our hammer handle project video. Today we're going to carry on with the project and work mainly on the threaded end of the handle. Here's where we're at now. Now our part has been surfaced to length. We have our uh, center hole here. We have our knurling completed. We have our two grooves. And the back end of the handle has been drilled, reamed, and chamfered. So that's where we're at. And this is the end that we're going to be working on today. And here we're going to be turning a diameter up to a shoulder. So we'll be turning a shoulder as well. We'll be threading that diameter, but before that we'll produce our thread clearance groove at the end of what will be threaded. Then we'll be producing a 4.7 millimeter radius groove that'll lead into, eventually, the taper on the handle. And the taper, we're going to be looking at it two ways, but in the part four video of this series. So this is what we're working on today. So let's get to it. Here's the line that we laid out previously that ensures that the part sticks out far enough from the face of the chuck to permit us to perform all the operations on this end without moving the part in the chuck. Because if we did, well, that would affect concentricity. For these turning and facing operations, we're going to use our general purpose turning and facing tool. The same one that we used to face the hammer handle down to its final length. Now, we're going to rough position the tool to start with, and then I'll bring the tool up to the part to verify that I have clearance on both the face and the side of the part, since we're going to be turning the threaded diameter and facing the thread's shoulder. 5 degrees clearance on the face and 5 degrees on the diameter. That's why our tool, the one that we sharpened at the very start of this course, well had an 80 degree turning and facing tip, which means that I can get into an inside corner without rubbing on either face of the tool. So I'm going to set my turning speed close to 600. It doesn't have to be really accurate. And note that I'm going to approach the part using manual feed. Now this is our first lathe project and using automatic feed when we're not really comfortable with the machine is asking for trouble. So for this first project we're going to limit ourselves to manual feed only. It's important to note that you can't feed at just any speed. Too slow rubs, too fast tears off. So you want to maintain something around six thousandths of an inch per rev. Now that's hard to figure out when you're doing it by hand. So just feed at a rate that produces a nice continuous chip. Seen as we're just starting out, you're going to want to measure often. But what diameter do we want? This is a threaded diameter for an M10 by 1.5 thread. That's a metric thread. Its major diameter is 10 millimeters. But for a thread to work properly, its major diameter cannot be its final diameter, because if it was, it would bind in the hole that we're threading it into. You have to remember that if there's no clearance, there's interference. How much smaller should this diameter be compared to its nominal 10 millimeter diameter? Well, for threading with a die, we have a formula. And the formula is uh, nominal diameter minus, open brackets, pitch divided by 7.5, close brackets. So M10 by 1.5, that would mean 10 millimeters minus, open brackets, 1.5 divided by 7.5, close brackets. And the answer to that is 9.8 millimeters. So what I've done here is I've turned my diameter to 10 millimeters. Why not 9.8? We just figured that out. We'll see in a few seconds. Now, you may have noticed that I haven't 
cut right up to the shoulder. We can still see that line that we laid out earlier. And why is that? Well, it's because I want a nice square shoulder. So my diameter will be turned with the longitudinal axis and my shoulder will be faced with the cross slide axis. And that will give me a true 90 degree corner between those two surfaces. If, however, I had chosen to use the longitudinal axis, well, I would have plowed into that shoulder full width of shoulder. And that would be a huge surface of contact and probably wouldn't give a very good finish. And on top of that, the part's shoulder would be only as square as the edge of the tool. You have to remember that we position the leading edge of the cutting tool at a 5 degree clearance in the transverse axis. That means that my shoulder, if I used that surface to cut with, would be inclined at 5 degrees. So, now I'm going to position the tool for my last pass on the shoulder. Now I'm going to be plunging in uh, just as I did when I surfaced the end of the hammer handle. But this time I'm not going to go right to the center of the part. I'm going to stop plunging when I get to the position that will give me my 9.8 millimeter diameter. Then I'll take my finishing pass by feeding away from the shoulder. That'll give me a nice crisp corner and eliminate any chance of collision. And once I've made sure I have all my dimensions, I can move on to a final deburring for safety and to produce a lead-in chamfer for my threading operation. The next operation will be to produce the clearance groove at the end of the thread. And for that, well, we're going to use a parting and cutoff tool. It's a form tool that's going to transfer its shape to the part. In this case, a square bottomed groove. Now, these grooving tools need to be set up very perpendicular to the axis of rotation of the part. And to ensure that I am perpendicular, I'm going to use the face of my three-jaw chuck as a reference. If I want to produce a deeper groove than the one that I'm producing here, well, I'll want to make certain that I am really well aligned. And for that, well, I could have used some shim stock and the face of the chuck. And if I needed to be very, very, very accurately aligned, because let's say I was performing a parting or cutoff operation, I would then use a dial indicator and the cross slide axis to align the tool much in the same way that was shown in our aligning a milling machine vice video. This RPM is way too high. So when we're using a manual feed on a part off tool or a grooving tool, we really have to turn the RPM way down. I've also positioned the tool longitudinally so that it's almost rubbing, but not rubbing on the shoulder that we've already produced. Our feed needs to be very slow, two to three thousandths of an inch per rev, or when we're using manual feed as we are here, just fast enough to avoid chatter, but not so fast that the tool jams in the groove. Chatter equals poor finish. Jamming the tool in the groove equals broken tool and damaged part. Grooving and parting are simple operations that are difficult to master. So practice before trying to produce a useful part. Now, threading on the lathe is a very complex operation and it is very difficult to master. So since this is our first lathe project, we're going to use a die to produce our thread. So this is the die stock side of the tool and it goes up against the tail stock spindle. The other side, the die itself, goes up against the diameter that we want to thread. Now I'm going to use the tail stock spindle to keep this tool aligned, to keep it tracking nice and straight. Now for that I'm going to have to lock the die stock 
but I don't want to lock it completely. I just want it to not be able to rotate. And for that, well, I'm going to lean it up against a straight edge of the tool holder. That will permit it to slide longitudinally, but it will stop it from rotating. Then I'm going to just, with the spindle in neutral, turn the spindle very slowly and maintain a very, very light pressure on the tool with the tailstock. This will force the tool to track parallel to the axis of rotation. But be careful. This technique should only be used to start the die onto the part. Once you're about two-thirds into the die, retract the tailstock. Get the tool holder out of the way. Then you can lock your spindle and continue threading in the normal fashion. It's important not to use a tailstock for the whole thread because the light pressure that you're applying with the tailstock can wreak havoc on the thread's pitch. The die will continue to track properly as long as you apply only a radial force and an equal radial force on each end of the die handle. As you're threading, back the tool off regularly, about a half a turn. This will break the chips and greatly reduce the force required for the threading operation and will also reduce the chance of breaking or jamming the die onto the part. And remember, using a good tapping oil can really help the tool to cut smoothly. Next, we're going to produce a concave groove. And for that, we're going to need a convex cutting tool. In this case, it's going to be a 4.7 millimeter convex radius tool that we've sharpened by hand. And you thought this was going to be easy. What we need to know now is the distance that separates the shoulder from the outer edge of the radius groove. If we look at our detailed drawing, we see that the shoulder is at 221 millimeters from the end of the handle. We also see that the center of our 4.7 radius is at 213.3 millimeters from that same reference. So if I want to know where the edge of my radius cutting tool should be, well, we need to say 221 minus 213.3 plus 4.7 equals 3 millimeters. So the edge of my radius tool should be at 3 millimeters from the shoulder. And we're going to use the depth measuring blade of our vernier caliper to position the tool. Now, I'm compromising a bit here because this isn't the method that I would normally use. Now, I would have brought the edge of the tool up to the shoulder, then set myself to zero, backed off, advanced, well, the width of the tool, plus three millimeters, and that would put the tool exactly where I want it. But in this case, the radius on the tool is too large to permit touching the shoulder of the part with the flat edge of the tool. The radius on the tool isn't too large by very much, just 0.2 millimeters, but it is too large. The diameter of the groove doesn't appear on the print. To find it, I have to calculate 19 millimeters minus two radii of 4.7. That gives me a diameter of 9.6 millimeters. Let's stop it right here because there's something very important that needs to be said and that is that the contact between the tool and the part is massive. And not only is it massive but it is multi-directional. A very long cutting edge contact well, requires a lot of force to maintain a cut. And that can be problematic, especially on small machines, because if I push too hard, I'll stall the machine and probably jam the tool into the part. On the other hand, if I don't feed fast enough, I can't maintain a chip. And, well, if I don't maintain a proper chip, I'm going to get a lot of rubbing and or a high frequency chatter, squealing if you prefer. So what can I do? Well, the easiest thing, since we're using manual machines here, would be to reduce your RPM. So why would that help? Well, reducing your RPM means that you can reduce your feed. Now, you're going to want to maintain a feed just high enough 
to lift a chip and just low enough to avoid squealing. And that's a very fine line to walk. Now, slowing down, well, it just makes everything easier because it gives you more control. Because in this case, you're going to want to produce a very thin chip, somewhere around two thousandths of an inch thick. And that's important for the second problem also, the multidirectional problem. This chip is coming into the tool by all directions, and those directions all meet up in the center of the tool. And what does that mean? That means crinkling. If you think about it, the edges of this chip are much longer than the center of the chip, and that's why they need to buckle. And you can see it here, with this chip resting on the cross slide. Now, you've probably already figured out why I'm mentioning the crinkling problem. Well, it's because if your chip is too thick to permit crinkling or buckling, well, you're back to your three undesirable results. That is, the machine stalls, the part is damaged, or your tool breaks. Now that we've completed all the operations on this end of the handle, well, we can pull it from the chuck, take a good look at it, and pat ourselves on the back for a job well done. Because, hey, no one else is going to do it. You know where we started, and, well, now you know where we ended up. Our handle is really complete, uh, except for the taper, and we'll be looking at that in the part four of this series. So. Until then, have fun, be safe, it's so important, and happy machining.